Uh, like we said, my name is Dakota Rapp, and I'm going to be presenting my thesis research that I did at Kentucky State University on the economics of deboning big head and silver carp and production of that bonus. What did I do? Oh. So first off, we have the big head carp, uh, Hypothalamichthys nobilis. Uh, it is a large river planktivore native to Eastern Asia. As the name kind of suggests, they can get pretty large. Uh, they don't get quite as large as the silver carp. They can get up to like 88 pounds in the Mississippi River. Um, and they predominantly eat zooplankton. Um, they're the fifth most cultured species in the world, and that's behind grass carp, silver carp, common carp, and Indian carp. Um, they're not cultured in the United States, but as I'm sure most people in the room know, they have been introduced to the Mississippi River Basin. Now we have the silver carp, Hypothalamichthys melitrix. Um, kind of a similar story, large river planktivore native to Eastern Asia. They can get a little bit larger, like I said, close to 100 pounds. Um, they eat predominantly phytoplankton. They kind of have these pretty cool gill rakers that are more of a sponge. They secrete a mucus to it, and that's actually how they catch their phytoplankton. Uh, they're the second most cultured species in the world with 5,000 metric tons produced in aquaculture every year. That's not wild harvest, that's just aquaculture. Um, again, not really cultured in the United States, but have been introduced to the Mississippi River Basin. Um, one of the things that I learned while I was out with these fish is kind of how to identify them. They can look kind of similar, especially when they're at smaller sizes, which we commonly see in the Mississippi River. You want to look at the keel. A big head carp will have a strong keel from the vent to the pelvic fins, whereas the silver carp will have a strong keel all the way to the throat. Another thing you want to look at is the placement of the pelvic and pectoral fins. The silver carp will have a pectoral fin that does not surpass the origin of the pelvic fin, whereas the big head carp, the end of the pectoral fin is noticeably behind um, the origin of the pelvic fin. So, the U.S. was invaded by these fish. Uh, they were brought in in the 1970s by an Arkansas fish farmer to control phytoplankton levels in his ponds. They also were in some um, state and national fish hatcheries down in that neck of the woods. Um, but by the 1980s, due to flooding and um, accidental stockings, they had have, they have gotten into natural waters. Um, right now, big head carp have been reported in 27 different states. Silver carp have been reported in 19. And they've been shown in recent studies to affect native planktivoric uh, condition factor. That's most notably the gizzard shad and the big mouth buffalo. Also, this poor guy in the bottom has found out the hard way that these fish also pose a human, self, or human health and safety um, risk while on the river. Mississippi River is kind of a big recreation area for people in the Midwest. And uh, the silver carp, in particular, when they're spawning in the summer, are startled pretty easily. Kind of a defense mechanism, we think. They jump out of the water. Um, whack people in the face, break jaws, bruise people's ribs, um, break fishing equipment. So there's also that to be, uh, well, we can think about that going forward. So there's been a lot of questions of how we control this species, or these two species. Um, what's really the best way to keep them from spreading, to try to knock their numbers down? Um, some things have been tried. Um, a lot of things have been proposed. Electric barriers, I'm sure you've all heard about the Chicago Shipping Canal and electric barriers put in there. Uh, CO2 bubblers, physical barriers, but there's really no perfect solution. Some of these things are cost prohibitive. Other things just affect native fish too much to really, to really be um, feasible. Um, and none of these methods are really 100% effective. Um, so you might be asking, why not eat the carp? They're the number two and five most cultured fish in the world. They must taste good, and I can tell you they do taste good. They taste very good. Um, they have a really mild tasting white flesh. It's got a really nice firm texture to it. And it's got, um, well, it's popular in ethnic markets. Um, people really like these fish live, prefer, uh, particularly Asian, Asian markets. Um, Americans don't like bones in their fish. We don't like it. Um, we like to put the filet in our mouth in one piece and swallow it without even chewing it. Um, and we also have a problem with people seeing carp as a poor quality fish. You hear this name carp and people, maybe it's, maybe it's too close to another four letter word. Uh, that people don't really like. But people kind of think of these fish as bottom feeding fish that are going to taste like mud, which is just not true. They feed lower on the food chain. Um, and they really taste good. So these are the intermuscular bones that I kind of alluded to in the previous slide, uh, which makes it so hard for Americans to really choke these fish down, uh, pun intended, I suppose. Um, but they have these intramuscular bones that are shaped like a Y. Now, we're probably all familiar with salmon and trout with the pin bones that you can pull straight out. Um, 
It's a problem with these fish because of that Y shape. You can't really pull them straight out. Um, they're not easily removed. People choke on them. They don't like it. So this little graphic here kind of shows you how these Y bones are oriented within the fish fillet. Um, just keep that in mind going forward because I'm going to talk about how we got these bones out. Um, people have tried to deal with these bones in many ways. Some, mostly in Europe, they've tried scouring the fillets. Uh, they have a revolving disc that they kind of run the fillet over and then fry it in an effort to dissolve the bones. Um, down in Arkansas, they did some studies with big head carp canning it and mincing it where the bones are softened or crushed to the point where you can consume them safely. Um, people have smoked this fish so that the flesh simply falls off the bones and you can just pick them out as you eat. And for our purposes, we kind of looked at manual removal via fillet. So our study objectives here were to outline a process for manually producing boneless, big-headed, silver carp meat, determine the market willingness to pay and perception data, um, and determine a break-even price for small-scale processors. And this was kind of um, more region-specific, kind of Kentucky, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, the <coughs> area of the country. So getting into our deboning process, for our economic model that we built, we had four basic steps. We were filleting the fish, skinning the fish and taking the red meat off of the fillet, deboning the fish, and packing the fish according to HACCP guidelines. Um, the only thing I really want to mention with filleting fish, most of you in here I'm sure have filleted many fish in your life, um, made a post opercular cut. The only really important thing that I want to draw your attention to is right around there at that tube, there's a bone that's shaped like a pine cone in there. It's very, very hard to get out. It's not worth your time. So as we were filleting, we just kind of made an angled cut to make sure that that wasn't in our meat that we were working with. Um, then we just simply followed the median septum posteriorly until we got past the ribs freeing the fillet. So, and this is basically, it's not the prettiest picture, but this is basically the fillet that you're gonna end up with. Now, the yellow portion down there is the piece of meat that would be overlying the ribs. Um, that's gonna be boneless, so you can remove that right away. Now these two blue portions, if you'll remember how I showed how the Y bones are oriented, that's where the short branch of the Y bones are going to present in the fillet. You can feel them with your finger as you run your hand across the fillet. So that's really what we're going to be looking for going into the deboning step. Um, so basically what you want to do is locate those bones and score on either side of the short branch until you contact the long branch of the Y. And then you're going to flake the flesh outward, being careful not to cut it all the way out. Because we're going to flip the fillet over, we're going to cut from the back side, and basically what you're going to get is two V-shaped chunks of boneless meat. Um, that um, are pretty workable and uh, palatable to American consumers. So we collected all of our processing data. Uh, we did time for each of those steps to put into our economic model. Um, we collected the whole weight, maximum total length. Our dress out yields both to bone in fillets and to boneless meat. Um, and we did a correlation analysis uh, to make sure we weren't really, well, to make sure one thing wasn't affecting the other. Um, then we did two sample t-tests to compare the two fish, uh, and we of course did an f-test to figure out if our data was hetero or homoscedastic um, with an alpha level of 0.05. So the only difference we really, the differences we really saw in our processing data were that our silver carp were on average larger than our big head carp. We had a better dress out yield from our silver carp, and um, it took longer to skin the silver carp though because, and I think what that is, is our silver carp had a little bit more red meat on them, so we had to spend a little bit more time working with the fillet to get that red meat off of it. Um, so going into this, there were some suggestion, suggestions that as the fish got larger, we would see better and better dress out yields. That was supported in big head carp, but it was not supported in silver carp. Um, and again, that might be because of the prevalence of red meat in the silver carp. Um, the other thing we were looking at is big head carp, the name, big head. Um, we were thinking maybe the big head carp actually had more weight tied up in their, in their head. Um, so we kind of checked on that. That was one of the things we looked at. And it turns out there's no difference. They're both right around 78% of their weight is tied up in their head, their fins, and their major uh, skeletal features. Um, moving on to our marketing portion. Um, some past studies have been done comparing big head and silver carp, mostly big head carp, to salmon, tuna, tilapia, catfish. Um, across the board, people have loved this fish. They've thought, thought it tasted really, really good. Um, however, one of the studies that was done in the mid-90s by Angola and Kalka down in Arkansas showed that as soon as people were told that this product was carp, their willingness to pay dropped drastically, um, again, with that, that perception with the name. 
Um, so basically what we did, we took one pound bags of each of these fish, provided them to restaurants, uh, chefs in Kentucky and Ohio, asked them to evaluate quality via a Likert scale, um, asked them to uh, circle a price that they would be willing to pay for these fish. Um, we did not tell them what fish each was. We said they were Asian carp. We didn't tell them what type they were. Uh, we didn't really want any preconceived notions of big head or silver to get in the way. Um, like I said, collected via anonymous survey, and we analyzed our data using a two sample t test and a man with EU test. The only real difference, as we saw, was that people thought that big head carp tastes better. The silver kind of got the, uh, we kind of, it kind of got back to us on the silver that people thought they kind of tasted a little bit like grass. They tasted more like a lake fish, but they would, that's kind of how they described it. Um, but they did think that big head tasted better. Now, with our willingness to pay data, um, People were willing to pay a little bit more for a better tasting fish, not surprisingly. Uh, it's $6.33 a pound on average, $9 maximum for big head carp, um, $5.64 per pound for silver, and $8 maximum. And just asking you to keep that in mind because I will get into that a little bit later. We're going to have a little bit of fun with that. Um, one thing I want to say is all of these restaurants thought that these fish should be served at the restaurants. And that's I think that's kind of a feel-good factor with people know that these are invasive fish in that area. Um, they want to feel like they're helping. They're helping with the problem. So there's kind of a push for that. Um, so as I said, chefs prefer the taste of big head carp. Um, however, as I'll get into later, big head carp um, willingness to pay was too low to really make a profit off of this fish. Whereas silver carp willingness to pay was lower. Um, but because we were getting higher dress out yields and our fish were bigger, um, it's likely that it might be profitable and that's what I'm going to move into next. So moving into the economics, this is just a schematic of what type of processing facility we're talking about on a small scale. Um, this is kind of a family run. These, these exist along the Mississippi River. Um, some farmers have their own little processing facilities that can be certified for fish processing. And you're basically talking about five or six people working one of these, maybe one day a week for 24 weeks out of the year. So it's not, it's not a substantial um, time. But you're not sinking a lot of time into running this. Um, so our economic model was built using Crystal Ball, which is an add-in for Excel. Um, it models operation costs for an eight-hour processing day. Um, we basically fit empirical distributions to our real-world data and then used a bootstrapping procedure to um, come up with 5,000 different iterations of data based on our real world data. I realize that sounds pretty dense. Um, I cut out a lot of this. But anyway, the goal of our model was to outline the number of fish that were, profit, or that were processed per day for the maximum profit that we could possibly get. Um, that's going to tell us how much deboned meat we could produce um, and also how much money we were going to make and how much it cost us to run this enterprise every day. Um, so our objective function, as I said, was to maximize daily profit, and that's a function of our revenue minus our operating and um, fixed costs. So our operating costs took all of these things into account. I'm not going to read them all. Um, one of the things I want to draw your attention to, though, is labor cost. We did two different scenarios, a $10 per hour labor cost, which kind of simulates family labor as if you had friends and family helping you run this enterprise. You're not going to pay them quite as much. Um, sorry, friends. Um, <laughs> And we have a $14 an hour scenario, which is the average wage that a fish processor makes in Kentucky. Our fixed costs were adapted from Descupta et al. 2006 and adjusted for inflation. And they came out to be right around $120 per day for all of those things that you see listed there. Another thing that we really dove into was our labor allocation. We wanted to see how many people we wanted to put at each of these processing steps to get the most bang for our buck. Now, if you look really close here, a lot of negative signs there, 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 and there. Um, we had a bottleneck at our deboning station because it took twice as long to debone the fish as any other step. The only place where we really wanted to allocate additional labor was our deboning station. Putting an extra person at filleting, skinning, or packing really didn't help us very much other than increasing our operating cost. So these graphs kind of put, give you a visual of what I'm talking about here. Um, you can see the red bars are our one employee per station. Um, as soon as you put two people at the deboning station, you're going to see a big bump in production. However, when you allocate further labor past that to the other stations, um, you're going to get a little bit of a bump, but it's not justified because you're going to be paying for all of that labor. Uh, so, on average, we can process 179 big head carp per day and 135 silver carp per day. 
However, due to the higher dress out rates of silver carb, we can produce roughly 175 kilos of uh, silver carb to like, I think it was 125 kilograms of big head carb. So you're getting more silver carb meat out of this. Um, not surprisingly, our labor translates into our break even price. So you're going to be paying more people, your break even price is going to go up. Um, one of the things I want to draw your attention to is this red line here. That's your $5 per pound line. So that's kind of where your tilapia, catfish, some other common fish are going to be at. That's what they're going to be being sold at. Um, the takeaway here is you're not really going to be able to sell the big head carp below that. Um, they're, oh, wrong, sorry. they're more expensive. They're well above that $11 per kilogram mark. Um, so. Moving on to our daily profits here, uh, what does this mean for the producer, the person who's actually going to be doing this enterprise? Um, you really can't make money off Big Head Carp unless you are paying your employees on the $10 end and you're selling them for that $9 maximum willingness to pay. That's really the only way that you're going to make money off of Big Head Carp using this enterprise. Um, if you're paying family labor and selling at the average, you're only going to be making $30 a day. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't sound like a really good deal to me to work all day and make $30 um, between all those people. So, um, but silver carp, what we did see is you can make around $400 a day if you're paying your people $10 an hour for labor and you're selling at that average willingness to pay. Now, if you're lucky enough to pay people at that $10 per hour labor, but you're also lucky enough to sell that $8 per pound uh, maximum willingness to pay, you can make close to $1,500 a day off this enterprise. Um, so it's a lot more feasible, um, something that people might actually consider doing. Um, so in conclusion, more big head carp could be processed per day um, due to those faster processing times. However, silver carp had lower break-even prices because um, you have those better uh, is my uh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh yeah, higher yields of meat. Uh, thank you. Um, so, because you're uh, you're seeing those lower break-even prices, these fish might be uh, more competitive with other similar products that you might see uh, tilapia and catfish. Um, even though big head carp were preferred by chefs, um, this is this is kind of unfortunate because. If we're thinking about our trophic levels, um, and they're eating at different levels, you're seeing about 10 times more silver carp being caught out of the river than the big head carp. So it's much easier to catch silver carp than it is big head carp, which is good on the hand that that's more profitable, but it's unfortunate because people would really like to see the big head carp if they think they taste better. Um, silver carp, like I said, may be competitive with other products at that $5 per pound uh, price point. Um, one thing we do want to look into in the future is if we scale up this production level, do it on a larger scale, see if that would that would change the economics of this drastically. Um, we kind of want to look into different product forms. Um, this is just really, really wasteful. Uh, this, this is catered towards American consumers, generally wasteful. Um, we're only getting around 11% dress out to boneless meat of this entire fish. So if you're thinking of like a 30 pound fish, you're only getting 11% of that back in boneless meat. Um, so, I would like to finish off by acknowledging the Missouri um, Big Rivers and Wetlands Field Station. Those guys can really rip through some carp. They really know how to process these guys. And I can assure you that they hate these fish. They want to see them eaten. Um, Two Rivers Fisheries in Wycliffe, Kentucky, uh, provided me with some of the fish for this product, or project. They actually ship about half a billion pounds of these fish back to China every year. Um, return to sender, I suppose. <laughs> um, I would like to thank my graduate committee and, of course, the USDA NEFA Capacity Building Grant that funded this project. Um, they're actually doing a whole lot of other cool stuff, uh, whether it be turning the fish into a Serimi product, um, doing some sort of texture uh, analysis and stuff like that. So there's more to come out of Kentucky State University on these projects, um, some of my references. And with that, if I have time, I will take any questions. Uh, I mean, it's four now, but you have the last one. Thank you.